Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise. We bring you interviews with professionals in the movement and exercise field. The goal is to provide information for other professionals and also amateur movement aficionados, people who understand that movement is part of what makes life complete. Some of the people we interview you will have heard of. They're well known in and outside of the movement and exercise profession. Others you may not have heard of, but they have a great deal of knowledge to share. Many people doing the best work spend their time working with people, not working on their social media presence. We're going to give you a chance to learn from some of these talented and knowledgeable individuals, and we're going to learn along with you. Moving to Live podcasts are going to be short. Each interview will be long enough to impart usable information, but short enough to be able to be consumed in a single bout, during your workout, commute, or even during dinner prep. We all like long-form interviews, but time is valuable. Moving to Live wants to give you the option to learn and be entertained without needing to commit 60 minutes at a time for an interview. Give Moving to Live a listen. Check out our sister podcast, FitLab PGH, which highlights people, businesses, events, and activities in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area that make movement a priority. Moving to Live would love to hear from you. Want to connect with us or have an idea for somebody you think we ought to interview? Drop us an email, mov2liv at gmail.com, or connect with us on Instagram and Twitter, both underscore MOV number two LIV. We're excited to bring you these interviews, and we think you'll enjoy each and every one that we bring you. Moving to Live in our sister podcast, Fit Lab PGH, firmly believe that movement should be treated as a lifestyle, not just an activity, because movement is part of what makes your life complete. Check out part two of our interview with Trisha Montgomery of K9 Fitness coming up now. Welcome back to Moving to Live, which along with our sister podcast, believe that movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity. A big thank you for Eric Malzone of the Fitness Blitz and Future of Fitness podcast for introducing me to part two of today's guest, Trisha Montgomery, founder of K9 Fit Club. In part one, Trisha told us about her path from obesity to exercising with her dog. And we're going to come back with part two and find out about the Canine Fit Club, talk about pet obesity and how moving with your pet can help not only you and your pet, but also enhance the quality of life for both of you. So, Tricia, thanks for being willing to come back and talk to Moving to Live with part two of our interview. Uh, Ben, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me back. Really enjoyed talking to you before and happy to share um, Canine Fit Club and all things associated. When we finished up the last interview, you were talking about how you ended up working for the Chicago Veterinary Medical Association. Tell us how the idea for Canine Fit Club came around. And actually, before you do that, for maybe some of the listeners who haven't heard part one, just briefly describe what is Canine Fit Club. Canine Fit Club is health, fitness, and wellness at both ends of the leash. Um, we have twenty over 20 science-based programs and parallel programs that people do with their dogs. But our programs are not just for one you know, uh, set audience. They're from the young to the young at heart. And for everything from papalotis, namasit stay, wagging wheelchair, um, it is movement for both you and your dog. And people and their dogs are losing thousands of pounds with Canine Fit Club and getting healthier and living longer, happier lives. And I think one of the things that people often say, if you want to be successful in business or successful in what you do, do something better or do something different. I know there's just so many places where they say, no, you can't bring your dog because we're not a dog friendly place. And it sounds like Canine Fit Club, just by the very name, is the exact opposite of that. It is. It is. It's a, it's a gem and programs that people come with their dogs. It, it's social. It's community. It is uh, health and wellness. Um, it is a gym for you and your dog. So how did you come up with the idea for Canine Fit Club and how did you make the decision to say, we're going to spread this across the country in franchises rather than just being this cool little place in uh, Chicago or, or some other place and people in your town said, Hey, we know who Trish is. That's pretty cool. Now people hopefully internationally uh, uh, are yeah. able to say, I know what Canine Fit Club is. Yeah. Um, I want to change the world. Um, I want to impact as many people as I can, and or we do. And um, my my dream, my goal, my vision is to have thousands of canine fit clubs everywhere. Um, for us, um, you know, if you look at other gyms, um, they're going after that same 
88% of the market of, you know, whether it's your CrossFit or your, um, of the Bark and Burn, the bar, you know, the, the, the six pack ad crowd. Um, there are, you know, the other huge, incredible audience that wants to work out, um, uh, that may not work out because they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel acceptable. And if you look at Canine Fit Club, people who exercise with their dogs exercise 34% more than those without a dog. Along with that, the dog is adding uh, motivation. It's decreasing their embarrassment and they're, they're really in, t- in taking away that, 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 lack of, that lack of self-confidence that they have. So when I was with the, the Chicago Veterinary Medical Association, I realized that, that my journey and my story um, was similar to other people's. And more often than not, if you see a person who is unhealthy or overweight, if you look at their dog or their cat, they, their dog or cat or their pet is overweight as well or not healthy. And I realized I, was, I had an idea and I was on to something. And so by way of the Chicago uh, VMA, I met a man by the name of Dr. Ernie Ward, the Association of Pet Obesity Prevention, who had just started that association because he realized the trend and the growing trend in, in pets and obesity and um, began to familiarize myself with, with really standards of excellence and, um, and looking at not just the veterinary profession, but looking at wellness and, and, and medical and looking at fitness and animal behaviors and, and thinking there's a need here. And um, that's, that's where it started. And I'm curious, this is probably, I think I know the answer to this. When you originally came up with this and started ruminating with it and putting it around in your head, were you thinking more about the benefits for pets or more about the benefits for pet owners or both together? I I think it was both together. And the reason why I say that is in order to get to to the dog, I've got to get to the human first. Um, a dog can't go and say, I'm going to go out and exercise on my own. I'll see you later, but back in 20 minutes, you've got to be as the owner to motivate that person to get up and move. And, um, it, it's a way that it, it's fun. It's a way for them to connect together. It increases the human animal bond. Uh, and, and, and they're doing something good for both the human and the canine, but, it's educating them. So we started in 2012. We were light years, uh, six, seven years ahead of our time. Because right now, this is 2019. The industry is just catching up with us, just catching up with us. So imagine being having an idea and being so far ahead of the curve and, uh, and, and continuing on and, and having people look at you like you had three heads. You're doing what? I don't understand. How do you do that? Um, but it's, it's, it's keeping it, keeping it up and it's educating people. We're talking with Trisha Montgomery of canine fit club. I think what you've demonstrated with what you're doing is phenomenal. And I know one of the things I say for my sister podcast, fit lab PGH, when we do movement tip and lifestyle hack videos, I often have my dogs in it. Dogs are not accoutrements. And what you're doing is you're, educating people not only on the importance of exercising with their dogs and exercising for themselves, but also inadvertently or maybe subconsciously making people recognize, look, if you're going to have a dog, that's a responsibility and it takes a significant amount of time. It's not just pat it on the head, throw some food out. It's a lot more work than having a cat. It is. It is. And I don't think people realize that it is a responsibility. There's to saying that people spend more time selecting a refrigerator than they do selecting a dog and or they see a movie and they go oh I want that dog and then they don't realize you know what all goes into that dog and the breed of the dog and the exercise of the dog and that's why when you're selecting a, a dog how important it is to understand your lifestyle your needs your living conditions your children all those things that go into it and and make an educated decision because if you don't exercise you don't want to get a Weimaraner. <laughs> so, you know, finding something, that, a, a dog that compl- a breed complements your lifestyle. It, that's so important. And I know I've got two Labradors and I often say a tired dog is a happy dog. And kind of as a corollary of that, it's much better behaved. Both of my dogs are much better behaved if they've been exercised on a regular basis. 
Absolutely, absolutely, and it it it's a way of of really both of you being tired together for the right reasons and um and and doing that bonding together. We also, with our audience, we realize that um, that people that may be unhealthy are going to come in because they're doing it for their dog. They're not coming in for themselves, but they will do it for their dog, and 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 they start to lose weight and then it becomes this natural to where the dog's excited. They're excited to come and, and, and see the benefits for both the human and the canine. You were mentioning a few minutes ago that you started in 2012 and you were way ahead of the game. If yeah. somebody is working in the fitness field just for humans, not involving canines also, there are lots of different models to follow everywhere from CrossFit to boutique fitness where you're going to specialize just in men and women from 70 to 75 who want to run marathons. So you can, mm-hmm. there's, all, there's all kinds of information out there. When you started, how did you first come up and say, okay, I'm going to have exercise where it's for people and their pets? You said you have over 20 programs. How do you start to do that when there's not a model prior to that to say, okay, this is what they do. This is how I can tweak it and put my own spin on it. You started with the spin. So people are probably now at the point where they're going, this is what Trish and Canine Fit Club are doing. How can I do it differently? Yeah, yeah. I had a dream and I knew that I didn't just want to reach a core audience because I think more often than not, people just reach that audience that can do it automatically. And coming from a background where I couldn't do things, I knew that I wanted to do different things. I also realized um, that there's also a need for, uh, for the elderly population and that people go into nursing homes or assisted living homes or independent living homes, and they're pretty much secluded there. And with, uh, with the certifications and with NASA, National Academy of Sports Medicine, um, I looked at that audience and thought, I... I bet we can combine the two. I bet we can combine exercise and the therapy of dogs. And so we really began working on the certifications. I became NASM certified. I became a power Pilates coach um, as well as becoming, I'm a veterinary technician as well. And then I began calling on experts who were the best of the best in their field from, you know, from the fitness community, from the veterinary community, from the medical community, to doctors, to Dr. David Levine from the University of Tennessee, who's the grandfather of canine rehabilitation, looking at animal behaviors, because we are not just a bunch of people throwing dogs around our neck and going into a squat. That is not work that, that, that may look at like working out with your dog, but that is unsafe for both the human and the dog. Um, We are doing science-based parallel programs, and with that is an efficient and effective and a safe movement uh, that that goes along with that, and which leads to the success of people and dogs not getting injured and, and, and again, losing the weight or becoming healthier and leading that healthy lifestyle and how very, very important it is. It's, It's important to call upon people. I am not an expert at everything. I know my lane. I will always say that I know my lane. But there are people that are smarter than me and more knowledgeable and more educated than me. And if you have a passion, if you have a dream, and you look at those people and you say, help me. <laughs> you know, and if they, if they believe it as well, uh, I, we couldn't pay anybody when we first started out. But they shared my vision of, of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to change the world they're still around. And that's a beautiful thing. I know one of the first people I interviewed for moving to live was a uh, movement professional, Rick Howard from over near Philadelphia. And he made the comment that he never turned down somebody who wanted to talk to him about his area of expertise. He said, I never want to be that person where I won't share what I know. And it sounds like you found this too. I, I know I've talked also with Eric Malzone, who's a fellow podcaster. You're surprised the bigger the name of the person, once you find out how to contact them, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or email, those are the ones who are so giving of their time and you would expect they'd be the ones who say, no, I just don't have time for you. Yeah, you've got to make time. It's, it's, I always say I want to be uh, focused outward, not inward. And I think when you give of yourself and you give of your time and, and people, then you really truly want to change the world and you truly want to help people, that it is so very important. Now, that being said, I will also say there are a lot of people right now trying to do what Canine Fit Club does. And so I get a lot of people who call and try to like get the keys to the kingdom 
<laughs> and, uh, and, you know, well, how did you do that? And, you know, and who did you contact? Because, you know, we're recognized by insurance companies such as Aetna and, and Medicare and Cigna and soon to be United Healthcare. We really, we spent years on our credentials and our recognition, including, you know, we were part of the very first pet and parent obesity conference with the Center for Disease Control. You know, we work with the Obesity Action Coalition. So our recognitions and credibility are so vital and important to our success as we move forward, as well as when people come in to a canine fit club or uh, our community, they know that we are certified personal trainers, that we're also certified canine fitness trainers, and we've melded the two of those together. And when you're looking at an exercise program, whether it's just human, whether it's just dog, or it's human and canine, please be sure to make sure that they research the credentials behind that person. And also, um, along that note, when you're working with canines and humans, you have to think about the veterinary standards of excellence. And I mentioned contagious diseases and zoonosis. There's canine influenza. And um, if, you know, if you're looking at, at defecation or urination, how do you clean that up? What do you do? Um, because that is, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a health hazard. And you've got to understand that movement of a human and canine, how important that is to look at those together. Because if you don't know the gait of a dog and that dog is kind of going to the side, if you don't recognize that those, that person needs to see their veterinarian and go see a rehabilitation specialist or on the human side, how they move together. That's why we do what we do, and that's why we take the time to do what we do, and that's why we're the, the pioneer and the leader in human and canine fitness. And I know you mentioned that you became NASM certified. Mm -hmm. We've talked in previous podcasts about the National Academy of Sports Medicine as one of the three or four most credible fitness organizations for humans. You mentioned a certified canine fitness trainer. I'm not familiar with that, and I imagine many of our listeners are not familiar with that, too. Could you briefly describe what that is? And where sure. somebody, somebody may be saying, you know, boy, I see there's a canine fitness club coming to my area, maybe in Pittsburgh, and I would like to start to work for them, and they're going to have to get a canine fitness certification. So with Canine Fit Club, we are an approved partner of NASM, uh, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So we teach an entire certification program, um, uh, which is three days, and then we go into the hours of certification that they have to achieve. So we're teaching human fitness, canine fitness. We're teaching human anatomy, canine anatomy. We're teaching setting up teams for success. We're teaching the human animal bond. We're te teaching veterinary standards of excellence. It is a very, very intense, really 32 hours of hands-on practicum of what we're doing and what we're teaching. And we've worked with these associations and, and organizations to get that credibility to when people come through our program, they receive CEUs for the other organizations, including the International Animal Behavior Consultants, Certified Council of Professional Dog Trainers, American Council on Exercise, and I can go on and on with what we've done. Uh, there is a certification specifically for a certified canine fitness trainer, and that is through the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And Dr. David Levine and Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Melli has have done just a phenomenal job in coming up with that. And uh, we worked with uh, University of Tennessee and Dr. David Levine specifically on these programs. So when Canine Fit Club comes up with a program, we come up with an idea. So whether it's, you know, Mama Sits Day or Bark and Bar or whatever it is, it's not just people in the back room going, oh, I think I've got an idea here and let's just throw it out there. Because we are overseen by the veterinary profession and of our partnership with NASM, it goes from our team to Dr. David Levine, University of Tennessee, to Dr. Ernie Ward, Association of Pet Obesity Prevention, to the University of Buffalo, to all of these different people that are surrounding us that critique it and look at it and say, okay, this, this needs to be tweaked. Nah. Rover Run Club, what leash are you utilizing? Are you doing retractable? You know, all these different kind of things that go into the components of making up a successful uh, programs and franchise. So because we've been operating since 2012, because of our standard of excellence, we have not had any injuries or any accidents with any of our clubs, except for one 50-year-plus man who decided to show up in front of a bunch of girls <laughs> his ankle so that's the only injury we've ever had in our in of our of all of our kin and clubs because we, we we're trained to recognize we're trained to understand the movement of a human and the human of a, and the movement of a canine and if we deal 
at times with an audience that has not exercised before. So they may be coming in and doing chair exercises with their dog at the very start. They may be coming in and just, we actually may have them come in at the start with just themselves. Because think about it. If I come into a class and I am unhealthy or, or overweight and I, my dog's pulling me and I'm everywhere, am I going to feel good about coming to that class again? No, I'm going to feel like people are looking at me. So I may never, ever, ever come back again. But if I'm taught proper movements and I'm taught properly and in a kind and a and loving, unconditional, loving manner, then I bring my dog in and I've learned the moves. I feel confident. I may have lost a couple pounds or I may have feel better and more confident about myself. Then I add the dog. It's just a win-win situation. We have a whole, I mean, there's a whole criteria for what we do from, you know, from liability forms to standards of excellence to health assessments to, you know, all of these things which are so valuable to what we're doing and which is why people, you know, come and, you know, and they're, they're continuing to come. They've been coming since 2012 and they're still coming to this day. I'm kind of curious. This is me geeking out as an exercise physiologist. I know for humans, there are all kinds of ways to measure exercise intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know as somebody who's a longtime Labrador owner, I've kind of become familiar with how to gauge whether I'm working my labs too hard, or I also recognize that there are different phases of depending what the temperature is outside. If it's 15 yeah. degrees out, we're going to do better. But what do you do with uh, canine fit clubs with these classes as far as gauging intensity? Because some of these classes, it may be for a Labrador, it's not that hard, but if somebody else is there with their dog and their dog happens to be a beagle, so are the classes divided by size of dog or fitness of dog, or is it all inclusive with modifications for each of the participants? It's all, yeah, Canine Fit Club is not an exclusive club. We are an all, I mean, everyone is welcome. Every body is welcome. Every paw is welcome. And um, we have a health assessment and evaluation prior to attendance in their first group class or their first attendance at a, at a private training session or semi-private training session. So we're learning more about them, their relationship with their dog, their exercise, similar to when you would go to an Equinox Fitness or a Lifetime Fitness and they're interviewing you about your health and, and, and the medical fitness forms and all of those things. We're doing the same thing, but we're looking at both the human and the canine and we're determining their fitness level. On that note, everyone starts out with begging for beginner class. That is our very first level one class unless they're they can't get up and it's more of a sit, stand, get fit class. Everyone starts out with a begging for beginner class and that's your level one class. You're going to have great Danes in with a chihuahua because you just, and it's cool to see because you know, you're moving together in tandem together. We do station work uh, within our clubs. Um, so you may have someone who's going into a wagon wall sit. You may have somebody who's going into, you know, a peanut squat. We utilize equipment for both the human and the canine. And so that both, both the human and canine are getting the benefits, whether you're, you know, part of the fit of the fit crowd or if you're, you know, just getting started. So, and the thing is with our, 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 our clubs and with our system, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a marathon runner. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're just starting out and, and unhealthy or obese, it, it matters that you're there and it becomes this family and the community that everybody's supporting each other. You know, it, it becomes this social thing. Um, all of our dogs are always on leash with us. They're never allowed off leash. Um, because it, I'm sorry, it's would, would you repeat that again? Because one of the things that I find when I walk with my dogs is it's impossible to complete a walk without coming across at least one unleashed dog that's not well controlled. So this is kind of my mm -hmm. pet peeve that I, I want to hear somebody other than me really emphasize it. Yeah, dogs must always be on leash. I don't, I, I don't care if you say your dog's friendly. I don't care if you say that your dog is controlled and he's the best dog in the entire world. All dogs must be on leash. No, we're only practicing positive reinforcement. We're not using any negative reinforcement. We're not, not using any martingale uh, shock collars or prong collars. We're using harnesses, and everything is done in a positive manner. No retractable leashes, and dogs are always on a certain amount of lead of two foot to four foot lead. And the dogs are controlled. And the thing is, when you're moving together and you're looking down at that dog, he gets the hang of it in about, you know, five, seven minutes. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, I get this. But regarding dogs off leash, um, dogs should be off leash unless they're, unless you're in your, your backyard and in an open field running. Because the thing is, your dog may be okay, but the other dog may not be okay. Or your dog may pick up a scent 
and he may be the most friendly dog, but say, you know, a, a breed of dog comes by, he may lunge or lurch after that dog, even though he's the most friendly dog in the world. That's just the nature of dogs. They just, you know, you can't, it, yes, I'm going to stop there and get off my soapbox. I'm on the soapbox with you. And I'm curious for educating other people too, why no retractable leashes or what's wrong with retractable leashes? Because with a retractable leash, you don't have control of it because you're looping it in, looping it out. And, and sometimes even with, with a retractable leash, that retraction can break and that dog can continue to go. And then you're harming or potentially harming the health and safety of the human as well. Because if you're off balance and that dog goes lunging, he sees a squirrel, he sees another dog, he's going after it. You as a human have lost your footing and you're going face planting down. And you may see, you're going to break bones, scrape your face or whatever. I've seen it happen more often than not. Retractable leashes are not safe. It sounds like with Canine Fit Club, in addition to the health benefits, it helps the owners. It's not a substitute for obedience classes, but it helps the owners have better behaved dogs because you're giving them tools, maybe in addition to the eight weeks or 16 weeks they've taken their dog for obedience class. And that's kind of like, okay, I'm done with that. The dog can sit some of the time. It sounds like to be active in a Canine Fit class, they're going to pick up or have reinforcement of good dog training skills. Absolutely. It's an extension of the dog obedience, or if they haven't had basic obedience, it actually assists with that. Keep in mind with dog obedience classes, um, you're, you're taught a certain way, sit, stay, you know, what, uh, heal, whatever the commands are, you're taught those basic commands and you're moving together, but you're not really, you're, you're more concentrated on the movement of a dog and making sure that dog sit, stays, heals, um, sit to stand, whatever it is. You're not concerned about the connection that you have together, and more often than not, uh, and that's a generalization. With the Canine Fit Club class, you're moving in tandem together, and it's the symmetry of the movement between the two of you. It's a parallel program, and you're increasing the human-animal bond. And so we find that really even dogs that haven't taken an obedience class or that haven't you know, done the class, within about seven to eight minutes, they're following along with the owner. You're looking at cue with the owner you're, or the dog, and you're, you're moving together. The dog's smiling. The dog's happy. The, the tail wags, the smiles. And, and it's just a different type of a movement. Um, now, they're going to get tired out more easy, um, but it's a, it's a, a tired dog is a, is, a, is, a, you know, is a well-behaved and a good dog. So that's a good thing. I think it's interesting that you say that. I know my last dog that I took through obedience training, the instructor would say, well, she's sitting, but she's not sitting the right way because she's sitting kind of cockeyed and looking up at you. And I remember thinking, and I didn't voice it because it was the instructor's like, I'm happy with this. The dog's sitting, the dog's looking at me. I'm never going to show the dog. She is a part of my family. And if she looks up at me, that means she's listening to me. Exactly. And she's happy. And that's that bond and that connection between the eyes of the, of the, of the human and, the, and the, the canine that I love you and I, you, I trust you. Remember, dogs rely on us. They trust us. They're, they love us unconditionally. And so um, by us training them properly and by us doing things together, doing more with our dog in, in healthy, positive ways, that it's only a plus for our behavior, their behavior, for our sleep, their sleep, our nutrition, this are living that longer, happier, healthier life. And would I be a, a correct in my assumption that you are able to identify dogs that may need more individual training with your pre-assessment so you, you would not be in a class where there's a, a dog that's overly aggressive? No, um, we are, we are, we are not an exclusive club, but that being said, if there is a fear-based dog or an aggressive dog or someone that does not feel comfortable in the group class, we will lead them to a semi-private or a private class. There may be dogs that will always do a private class because that dog may always be reactive to other dogs. So we want to make, we always make sure the class is safe for everyone coming into that class. Um, uh, yeah. I think it's interesting what you've said here with Canine Fit Club. I know that there are many human franchises as opposed to human and canine franchises where it's like we do classes. And I, I mean, we, yeah. could, we could name them, but we do classes and we have X number of people in the class where it doesn't do it. Sounds like there is the opportunity for at a Canine Fit facility to either have a private class, obviously it would cost more, or a yeah. semi-private if you had maybe a family and three or four dogs, the whole family could come, each one leading Correct. a dog. 
Yeah, that is that is correct. We do group fitness classes. We do semi-privates and privates. And we also do on-the-go classes. And so that's when we actually take our programs and go to uh, locations that may need our assistance and help for health, fitness, and wellness. And that could be an assisted living. It could be an independent living home because we are approved by Medicare and Aetna and Cigna and recognized by multiple organizations and, and uh, credentialed. We've been talking to Trisha Montgomery of Canine Fit Club. You mentioned, I believe, there are over 20 different types of classes. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That is correct. And I, and I, I know that we could say, please list them all, but then people are listening. They're not going to know that. <laughs> I suspect we'll probably ask in show notes for you to list them all. And I'm assuming that you're constantly in development, so there's more classes. We are. We are. And, you know, the whimsical names of Papalotti's and Namaste Stay and Wagon Wheelchair – They've allowed the seriousness of what we're doing because, again, people and their dogs are losing thousands of pounds with Canine Fit Club, but it's a way of bonding. It's a way for the human to feel comfortable coming in. And, again, for a person who may not exercise, I'm not doing it for myself, but I'm doing it for my dog and getting them up and off the couch and moving. I'm curious with the group classes, is there a maximum number uh, of dogs and owners that you have in one class? It is uh, space requirements, and it is determined by the the amount of space that you have, as well as the number of instructors within the location as well. So we're not teaching large 20, 25 classes, uh, or 25 person classes. It's just not safe. So if there was a class in a facility large enough for that, there would be multiple instructors. So That's each instructor correct. would only be working with a set number of that anim- is correct. animals, two-legged and four-legged. Right, right, right. Because again, as the instructor, unlike a, a typical boot camp class or a, a Zumba class or a, a whatever class that your Les Mills class, you're teaching both human and canine and you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to have your eye on both the human and the canine movement and how they're moving together and the gait of the dog, the gait of the human, getting onto a piece of equipment as well and how they're doing that and for safety reasons. So even when we teach a class of six to eight, we'll have what's called a wrangler with us that can assist getting that, that human and the canine getting onto a piece of equipment or working with them to make sure ensuring the safety and effectiveness of the program for both uh, the human and the canine. We've been talking with Trisha Montgomery of Canine Fit Club. I think she really exemplifies what I've always said. Dogs are not accoutrements. They're really part of your lifestyle. In part one of our interview two weeks ago, she really was generous enough to share her story of going from obesity to being fit. And not only that, but also taking her dog along with her in the journey. Uh, Part two, we touched on, probably I could talk for hours about the Canine Fit Club because I find it fascinating, but we've got a pretty good idea of what Canine Fit Club is. We're going to have extensive show notes, that including uh, a link to their website, which shows where you can find a Canine Fit Club. Tricia, I really appreciate you spending time with Moving to Live and explaining how moving with your dog can not only be fun and healthy, but also something that can enhance the quality of life of both yourself and your dog. Thank you for having me, Ben. Thank you so much. And remember that when you're when you're working out with your dog, you know, it's changing lives one dog at a time and you're getting a new leash on life. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Moving to Live. Make sure you check out the show notes for contact information for our latest guest, as well as links about all the things we talked about. Intro and exit music is Traveling Light by Jason Shaw. You can subscribe to Moving to Live on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play and be notified about new episode releases. Have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Drop us an email, mov2liv at gmail.com. Connect with us on Twitter or Instagram, both underscore mov2liv. Please tell your friends about Moving to Live. It's a go-to place for information for movement and exercise professionals and amateur aficionados who understand that movement is part of what makes your life complete. Until next week, keep on moving.